And we'll start with um, kind of FERC's guidelines on their expectations on um, documentation of the SQRA. This morning we've gone through a lot of process kinds of things. You know, how, how do you do it? Now we come to kind of, okay, so how do you document all of this kind of thing? What, what are the expectations? And again, this, is, this will be at least slightly different between the agencies because we each have our own specific guidelines out there, how we want to see certain things. So we've kind of split this in half. So I'll go through the, the FERC part of this. So, so just in, in general terms first, L2RA reports, level two risk analysis reports are submitted as part of the comprehensive assessment process in the report. So generally you have two reports. First, we'll talk about the kind of the subset, the L2RA report. I'll say typically written by the independent consultant team, although not always. Uh, there, there have been examples. In fact, we've had some here yet this year that the licensee has decided, hey, I've got an IC team and I'm gonna have a facilitation team. And the facilitation team is gonna be the one writing the report, not the IC team. So you may have instances where you, you have two different parties writing these two different reports. But I'll just say typically, we'd expect it to be written by the uh, independent consultant team. So that's where you document all the PFMA process and information, results, conclusions of that, as well as the L2RA. You're including all the supporting documentation and studies that went in to that effort, but it stops short of providing specific recommendations. So conclusions, findings, but maybe not what you would do next, okay? That's included in the comprehensive assessment report. That's the overarching report. That includes all the discussion from the background information that was reviewed, uh, all the operational kinds of aspects of the project, uh, looking at the anal analysis of record and providing information on that, site inspection and their observation and the evaluation of the licensee's dam safety program, including ODSP, public safety plans, uh, surveillance or monitoring plans, things along those lines. All of that information wraps up in the, in the comprehensive assessment report that's informed by the PFMA and the risk analysis. So that's where the independent consultant team has to assimilate all that information together, weigh it, sift it, and then come up with finally the overall project conclusions and recommendations there. So what we're asking is that the conclusions, or I'm sorry, the recommendations really be provided just in the comprehensive assessment report rather than having potential an opportunity for conflicting recommendations between maybe what just the L2RA report would see in, in its own versus what the IC team sees in whole, okay? Uh, the report outline is in Appendix B of Chapter 18. I know you can read every little, little word on that screen, right? But that's not what that's uh, up there for. I'm just gonna go through and just kind of highlight just general topics that, that the report covers, okay? What needs to be included to give you a sense. So background information, introduction, description of the dam, those kinds of things. We're gonna talk about the hydraulic loading. We'll talk a bit more about that here in just a minute, as well as the seismic loading and the consequences are all in here, okay? We're trying to set the stage again with, you know, kind of, kind of leading to the, to the final conclusions. Talk about the potential ferry mode analysis, the risk analysis and the evaluation of the risks on that. Do, do the risks exceed or not exceed FERC's guidelines? And then finally, what kinds of conclusions can you make from that? And then finally, the appendices. So supporting information and studies go kind of, kind of in the back, okay? So again, the report's trying to make a case all the way through here, building kind of one chapter after the other. So let's talk about the information in the appendices. So hydrologic loading, seismic loading, consequences. The report ought to include at least at a high enough level, a summary of each one of these. So as you're working through the report, you're getting a, an overall understanding of the importance of each one of these. So what is the hydrologic loading looking, look like? So having the hydrologic loading curve in the report would be important to get an appreciation for what kinds of things are we, are, are we looking at? Does the dam crest get, get overtopped at you know, one times 10 to the minus three, or is it one times 10 to the minus nine? Thing, things like that. Likewise, with the seismic loading, what kind of consequences are we looking at? The details of which 
All the supporting information that went into understanding each one of those is included in, a, in an appendix. Okay, so that might include technical memos, supporting analyses, figures, drawings, et cetera, are, are placed in the back in the appendices. Rather than kind of maybe bogging the reader down with all of the detail and trying to work your way through the report, again, we're trying to make a case for that, but also include the supporting information back for those who are interested in getting more information where they could go find that. So talk about the potential ferry modes and that information. You know, this was before kind of like the whole report that we had before for a PFMA and now, so we're summarizing the, the PFMA process, how the identification brainstorming process went, description, evaluation, screening, et cetera. All of the justifications for, you know, why a failure mode might've been ruled out, excluded, put into insufficient information categories, all that has to be included the, the rationale and supporting information, though, for that included in the report appendices. Okay, so I, I just point you to chapter 17. It, it has, I think, really good examples, actually in an appendix of all places, of how you might go through and document that kind of information. Okay. Risk analysis information, summary, methodology, approach, you know, and then providing a summary by, by PFM. So there's all this information provided here in, in the sub bullets on that. And all that information is included in the template in chapter 18. If you, were, if you use that template to kind of uh, help document the whole process in the L2RA, you already have all that information, what we're asking for in the report. So that's why that template was kind of put together just as even a checklist to make sure that you're including that information and providing that back to us. One thing that we saw when we were going through this process in our pilot studies is some confusion about where do I put that information? There, there can be a lot of detail in all of that. Some folks put it in the, the body of the report. And again, when you have a lot of failure modes, you can have a very long report and kind of get bogged down and all that. Some people put it in an appendix in the back and literally they, they put the, the templates there. I mean, there's nothing to have to regurgitate. It's just, here, you know, here were the templates uh, on that. Some were, were kind of creative and they put it in both places. So it made for, for quite thick reports, but it's in kind of two places. So we're, we're asking like, wherever you want to put it, that's fine. Just, just don't do it twice. You know, the, the problem is that some things get changed in the report or they get changed in the appendix. And, and now there, there's perhaps a conflict and we're trying to have to resolve that, you know, in the review process. So say, hey, wherever you'd like to be able to put that information, if there are just a few failure modes, maybe you want to stick them in the report. If they're 50 failure modes, maybe you want to stick them in an appendix, you pick, okay? There is some additional information in chapter 18 about the, the documentation and the kind of information and how it's presented, we would like to be able to see. So we would like to be able to find a way to see that you, you have tracked all of the candidate failure modes that you identified in the brainstorming session. So where did they all go? Some, you know, PFM number one, was it ruled out, excluded? You carried it into the risk analysis and here's its, you know, the est risk estimate for that. Where did it go? Give us a, a pathway so we can track where everything went so that we can be assured that nothing got overlooked or, or, or misplaced on that. So summary, summary tables like shown over here, you know, with the failure mode and then a disposition as, as far as where it went. And again, chapter 18 has two big tables in the back to say, hey, you know, maybe something like this, okay? We also are looking for summary tables of, so those failure modes that did get carried into the risk analysis, what individually are their risk estimates in the sense of what are their failure likelihoods and what are their consequences and what were those estimates associated with that? So again, something like this would be perfectly acceptable. That particular table comes from a spreadsheet that the Army Corps of Engineers has in an Excel file on their, their website. It's an SQRA, I'm trying to methodology, something or something that uh, is included on the RMC website that you can generate, you know, you can enter in your failure mode and the risk or the the likelihood of failure, the consequence in bins just like this, 
and it'll summarize it all for you. And a lot of folks have just used that table and provided that to us. There's an advantage to that because we also ask for all, of, all the information to be included on a risk matrix. So it looks something like this. Again, on the left-hand side in, in its kind of cartoon form over here, you know, when, we're, when we're doing all these estimates, we're, we're really looking at cells, right, on a matrix on this. So these are order of magnitude cells for failure likelihood and consequences. Sometimes teams say, I, I can't decide on, on one cell, one failure likelihood category, and it might span a couple of those to be able to capture some of, some of the, I'll say disagreements or, or differences in how folks, the team might look at things like that. But in, in all cases, there's a total plot on this. So you have to be able to add all of that up to be able to come up with what the total is. So the table on the right does the same thing. It's the exact same spreadsheet table that's on the RMC website and summarizing all the failure modes will automatically plot all of these for you as well. So again, rather than having these order of magnitude cells over here, they're just represented by dots. So each one of those dots is the centroid basically of an order of magnitude box or cell around each failure mode. So, and again, totals automatically calculated for you, be able to look at that. Okay, so we wanna be able to have that. It's, it has to look like this anyway, as far as the, the general uh, format, axes, number of, rows, number of columns, all of that kind of stuff. We're trying to standardize this in the sense that, at least from our standpoint, our perspective, you know, once, once we get up to kind of equilibrium, we're, we're gonna be looking at 70 or 75 of these coming in every year. And if every consultant and licensee wants to standardize things, it's gonna, we're gonna get cross-eyed. And from an industry standpoint, being able to kind of show these have somebody else be able to recognize them. We feel like there's some, some advantages of trying at least in the early stages to try to standardize what these look like. So again, encourage the use of templates. You don't have to use the one in chapter 18, but you do have to include, all, capture somehow all of that information when you're going through for each one of the failure modes here. And so we've tried to lay it out as far as the information you need for the general information of the failure mode, the descriptors, sketches to be able to put in there, uh, supporting information, performance monitoring, evaluation factors, failure likelihood and the justification, the confidence, sources of uncertainty to be able to capture all of that and then all the consequence information, whether it's life safety, economic or other consequences to be able to put all of that kind of stuff in there. And it actually goes on to a next page that I couldn't all fit on here but it, it talks about all them, the dam safety uh, action uh, plans that, that you might be considering. So what kinds of risk reduction measures might you be looking at? What are the, some opportunities for uh, enhanced inspection, enhanced monitoring, EAP enhancements perhaps uh, on all of that? So it's all captured on the templates. Again, you can color code it, you can do whatever you want to make it look fancier or whatever, but that's the kind of information that we're looking for to, to have submitted to us. From a risk evaluation standpoint, and we'll get into more of this on the, in, the next section, in the next session, but again, in the, in the documentation, these are the different risks that, that we are looking for in the level two risk analysis. So we're looking at incremental life safety risk, annual probability of failure, non-breach life safety risk. And again, Andy talked about all of these earlier. If there are other consequences like economic, cultural, et cetera, you know, what, what those risks are and evaluate those, they might be qualitative, they might be semi-quantitative. Uh, and then the, what we call the financial or damage state risks on that. And with all of these, you know, all these have to be congruent with the case that's being made to, to be able to say, these are why these risks are estimated where they are. What was driving that information? What was important? and critical that the team discussed to be able to say why this risk is considered perhaps high, moderate, or low in going forward. That, Carmen? Okay. 
So as we mentioned, the, the SQRA report is typically written by the local um, USACE district. Um, and, and Doug was kind of um, getting to this point as well that basically we're, we're condensing down all of the you know, project assessment results and conclusions and insights from the SQRA into this report. So we wanna try to do that in as a concise approach as possible. Um, a lot of times we see teams that bring forward reports that are, you know, 400 pages long or, you know, something that's just not manageable when it comes to the reviewers and, and higher up um, actually reading the material and, and being able to do that in a reasonable amount of time. So the more we can efficiently summarize um, the logic the, you know, what went into our understanding, the results, and the takeaways, um, the better off the, the team is going to be. Um, and then, you know, making sure, again, that the, the recommendations align with the results and um, what, what went into that. So if you remember in Module 3 this morning, um, Andy had a slide that kind of went through key steps in any risk assessment. So these steps here kind of follow that. It's a continuation of that. So um, once we've, you know, scoped and assessed and, um, you know, developed our recommendations that are path forward, and then we go into um, higher level reviews. So, um, you know, we typically have the, the products reviewed by a group of national experts. Um, and the local USACE district and division and local sponsor may participate in this review. And then the, the uh, report goes on to the Levy Senior Oversight Group, which we also refer to as LSOG. Um, so the, the Levy or the LSOG uh, makes an official recommendation to the agency Levy Safety Officer um, on the path forward um, coming out of that meeting. And um, then USACE uses the recommendation and the sponsor input to support the safety decision and, and how we move forward. So the LSOG briefing, um, this is really kind of where the rubber meets the road. The, the levy safety case is conveyed to the decision makers at this briefing. So making sure that um, we're kind of leveraging every tool we have to effectively communicate the case to those decision makers and give them the information that they need um, to, to know what decision needs to be made on the LSAC and the path forward. That's, that's what our job is as the risk assessment team. Um, so the, the LSOG presentation is probably the most high visibility product um, coming out of the SQRA. Um, it's, you know, the primary means of how we communicate the case to the decision makers. So it's really critical that the LSOG briefing is consistent with the report and the risk assessment findings and, and any, you know, uh, memos that document the path forward. Um, it's really easy, you know, to lose track. And, you know, if we go back into the report and make an update, to forget to go back to the presentation and the memos and make sure everything is consistent. Um, but that's, that's a really important step. And so some key questions that we need to ask ourselves before going into this briefing is, you know, is the case made adequately for the risk estimates um, and the characterization? Um, and th these are also questions that our reviewers come in with in their mind. Um, so I think approaching it from both sides really gets to the best end product. Um, another question is, is the case made adequ adequately for the LSAC based on the estimated total incremental risk and relative to the portfolio? Does it make sense? Um, and is the case made adequately for the recommendations and the risk management actions? So the LSAC memorandum, that's the other piece. So you have your report, you have your LSOG briefing, and you have your LSAC memorandum. Um, the Levy Safety Action Classification, or LSAC, is, is really an internal tool that um, 
USAID uses to kind of manage the portfolio and prioritize resources. It doesn't mean a whole lot to the general public, um, but it is an important um, kind of piece of information coming out of the SQRA um, for USACE. So the memo um, summarizes the type of risk assessment that was performed, what drove the incremental risk, um, the primary consequence centers, and the approved LSAC coming out of that LSOG um, discussion. And so depending on the level of the LSAC, so LSAC 1 is our most urgent um, classification that gets signed directly by the headquarters LSO or levy safety officer. Um, and then LSACs 2 through 5 um, would get signed by the deputy LSO. So this is our general report outline. Um, you know, and we've had a lot of discussion about the background chapter, the hydrologic hazards chapter, seismic hazards chapter, um, consequences, all those chapters that you prepare in advance of the SQRA. Um, so this is kind of how those get sequenced within the report. Um, so then that kind of boils down to your chapter seven, which is your risk assessment chapter. And this is really a really important chapter. And this is where, you know, you're conveying um, to the reviewers and the decision makers what the team's logic was and how they got to the specific risk characterizations they did for each of the risk driving failure modes. Um, so making sure that it's, you know, kind of there aren't any holes in the logic and, and aren't any loops um, left open is important. Um, so then all of that gets rolled up into chapter one and the executive summary. So again, that's a, a higher visibility part of the report that, um, you know, the LSOG members will review. Realistically, your higher level decision makers do not have time to, to read the report in its entirety for every project that comes through. So we have to be able to condense that down into a summary that still gives them the information they need to have a, an, a clear understanding of the risk drivers and the path forward. And so that's where that chapter one and executive summary come into play. Um, and then let's see. So in terms of um, on-site report preparation, the more you know, doc, like we've stressed um, the importance of note taking and um, documenting that discussion while you're there in the room. Um, the more you can do that and the more you can come out of that week with um, some of those report sections written, um, the better off you're going to be. And so there's different tools that you can use to do that. Um, Microsoft OneNote is a really good tool. Um, it allows all the team members to be in the same file at the same time. And so multiple people can be contributing um, notes and snapshots and you know snippets that, that are pulled up during the discussion that you want to, to have to refer back to um, when you go to finalize the report. Um, so that's a good option. Google Earth, um, a lot of teams have used um, just geo-referencing, you know, boring logs or performance observations and helping everybody get calibrated to where it's all oriented um, is really helpful. And then using tools like WebEx in the actual um, SQA sessions so that everybody can be looking at the same screen and, and sharing things um, digitally. Okay, any questions on documentation? either on the FERC side or SQRA, or um, I'm sorry, levy, you say it's levy side. Okay, let's go to the Socrative. And there'll be a few questions on documentation. All right, the first question is a true or false question. The primary difference between the L2RA report and the comprehensive assessment report is that the comprehensive assessment report provides recommendations. That answer is true, and 88% of you got that correct. 
Second question is also true or false. The outline for the L2RA report can be found in Appendix 18B of Chapter 18 from the FERC Engineering Guidelines for the Evaluation of Hydropower Projects. 93% of you answered true, and that is correct. The final question is, what are the three primary mechanisms that USACE uses to document and communicate the results of the SQRA? 100% of you answered correctly with one SQRA report, two LSOG briefing, and three LSAC memorandum. Good job, everyone.